Hello everyone and welcome to the FIDE Women's World Chess Championship where the challenger Lei Tingjie will challenge the three times Women's World Champion uh, Zhu Wenjun uh, for the title. Uh, to, to be granted this honor, Lei Tingjie had to defeat some very, very strong opponents uh, in the uh, Women's Candidates Tournament or rather in Women's Candidates matches. Uh, she faced Maria Muzichuk, Anna, uh, Anna Muzichuk and um, uh, Tan Chong Gi, the, uh, the 2017 Women's World Champion and she defeated all of them uh, in the in the quarterfinals uh, um, uh, she defeated Maria Muzichuk by drawing three games and winning one. She defeated Anna Muzichuk in the semifinals, also drawing three and winning one. And uh, in the finals against Tan Chong it was a bit uh, more difficult as she lost the first game, then she retaliated in the second, and then she, she proceeded on uh, winning the match, uh, granting her uh, the, uh, well, the honor and uh, uh, the privilege of challenging Ju Wenjun uh, for the title. So uh, the... Uh, uh, the the it, it it will be a bit different than the uh, World Chess Championship between uh, Nepo and Ding. There are some differences which we are going to discuss. It will be a 12 game match. Uh, six games. Uh, the first six games will be pl uh, played in Zhu Wenjun's home city of Shanghai, and the rest of the match will be played in um, uh, Lei Tingjie's uh, hometown of Chongqing. So six games here, six games there, and of course, if there will be tie breaks, I believe they will be also continued in uh, Tingjie's uh, hometown. Uh, I don't think they will be you know flying back as it's a, it's a pretty big. Uh, 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 distance if you guys are considering going there in person to watch the games it's like uh, 1700 uh, kilometers uh, between um, uh, the, the two cities uh, you know if you're uh, not into the metric system that's like uh, 1000 miles so uh, you know uh, something to consider if you are consider considering visiting uh, but okay uh, that being said uh, let's now cons uh, uh, discuss the, the time control and the price fund the price fund also uh, somewhat uh, uh, less than in the uh, Open World Chess Championship uh, between uh, Nepo and Ding, it was uh, two million euros. Here it's uh, five hundred thousand euros, and it's uh, it's also a different time control. Uh, here the time control is uh, ninety minutes for the first forty moves, followed by thirty minutes to the end of the game with a thirty seconds uh, increment starting from move one, which is a bit different uh, than when uh, Nepo played against the Ding. Uh, here uh, uh, Nepo and Ding had one hundred and twenty minutes uh, for the first forty moves, then sixty minutes for the next twenty moves, and and then 15 minutes for the rest of the game with a 30 seconds uh, increment starting only after move 61 or rather starting uh, only from move 61. So I don't know which one I prefer. I kind of like, um, I mean, I, I, I prefer that in the Women's World Championship you get uh, less time uh, for for uh, the game. So of course uh, the game should be, should be uh, sharper, uh, but also I don't like in the Women's World Championship that you get increments starting from move one. Uh, that kind of takes away the tension from the game. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, if um, uh, you're down on time, you're not getting increment. You have to reach that time control uh, to be granted increment. And basically in the uh, Open World cha Championship, uh, the increment is something that is used uh, if you already reach the end game and you really need time to finish the end game. So I don't know which one I prefer. I'm, I'm guessing uh, I'm guessing from the... From the uh, an Epo Ding because uh, I really hate uh, 30 seconds increments starting from move one, but I don't know. Also, I also like the shorter time control here for, for the entire game. So what do you guys think? And also something that I'm sure that will be asked here as it's asked in every video uh, where uh, we are showing uh, um, uh, women playing chess. Uh, a lot of you will ask why is there a separate men and women's uh, chess? Now, that's not really true. There is no men's chess and women's chess. There are women tournaments. Yes, that is true but you don't have men's tournaments you only have open tournaments uh so uh in if you if you think about it women have access to uh, all the tournaments that are being played in the world uh, they can play in any tournament and uh, men can only play in open tournaments they cannot join women's tournaments uh, at least for the moment unless um uh, you know the the trend uh, pro progresses to chess uh but uh you know it's uh, not as great as it seems although it seems like women have a lot more opportunities to go to tournaments and play uh, the price fund as you can see here the price fund is basically a quarter of the price fund that uh, was in the world Chess championship match between nepo and ding uh, the uh, not only is it um, a smaller price fund but also uh, as uh, you know it's it's uh, harder for women to compete with men at the moment uh, it, it will also be harder for them to actually win uh, in open tournaments so uh, you know it's uh, def definitely a trade-off uh, but yeah I just wanted to clear that up so there are no men and women tournaments there are only women tournaments and open tournaments 
now uh, let's check out the game uh, we've uh, uh, this is game four that I will be covering uh, uh, first three games I've checked them not a lot uh, not a lot of action there uh, in, in game one uh, Ju Wen Jun did um, have some maybe sort of an initiative but nothing serious like even, even the engine was struggling to give it maybe even a plus one like maybe 0 0.8 plus one and not nothing you know n nothing serious uh game two and game three were fairly quick draws and now we are into g in game four so if you have any other questions i will be more than happy to answer them uh we will also be pro uh, pro probably will be covering uh, all of the uh, other games until the uh, end of the match uh do just ask and i will answer them in, in the next video but now okay uh, it's a bit of a longer intro but i always give a longer intro when i'm only starting a certain tournament or or a match uh we are not going to do that in the other videos of the match so that being said let's check out the game uh Lei Ting Jie has the white pieces and she opens with pawn to d4 Ju Wenjun replies pawn to d5 we have c4 e6 knight to f3 and now knight to f6 we have knight to c3 and d captures on c4 so the three knights variation of the queen's gambit uh sorry d captures on c4 and now pawn to e4 uh, we have pawn to b5, defending the pawn on c4, and now pawn to e5. We've seen this variation quite a lot um, uh, recently, knight to d5, and now knight captures on b5. We have knight to b6, and now, uh, as the c4 pawn is defended, uh, bishop to e2. Just preparing the castle, we have knight to c6, and now castle. So all been seen before, absolutely nothing new here, bishop to e7. And now, uh, there even is a game that Magnus Carlsen played against Jan Nipomnici, and uh, Magnus lost this game to Nepal. He played it in the uh, Magnus Carlsen Invitational. Queen to d2 was played here by Magnus, uh, but instead we have bishop to e3 here, uh, which is uh, the top move recommended by the engine, so late in J uh, definitely prepared well. Uh, we have castles and now knight to c3, but again, this is all known theory. Uh, rook to b8 and now pawn to b3, challenging the c4 pawn. Uh, you always, uh, it's kind of a, uh, well, uh, it's kind of a thing in chess to challenge a more central pawn with a, with a less central pawn in here. The B pawn is challenging the C pawn. So C captures some B3, A captures some B3. Now you also get the semi-open A file for your rook and bishop to B7. We have queen to B1. Uh, and now knight to b4. Now you could uh, also just not give up the pawn on a7, but it's very hard to get an active game here as black uh, with uh, with the pawn on a7. Okay, the knight is defending it, but the knight cannot move. The pawn cannot move. You can't really put it to a6 as the bishop and rook are controlling that square. If you put it to a5 again, the knight cannot move. The bishop cannot come alive. So it's best to just uh, ignore it. Uh, knight to b4 was played. This uh, opens up the bishop's diagonal. Also gives the knight a very active square now the other knight is coming to d5 and black's position uh, definitely comes alive and there is a game where rook captures an a7 was played uh yakubo have played it against parham maksudlu their game ended in a draw uh, but here we have knight to e4 uh, instead of going after the pawn right away and now comes pawn to h6 there is a game where pawn to a6 was played but here pawn to h6 and it is now only as of move 15 that we have a completely new game so okay rook captures on a7 and now knight 6 to d5 we have bishop to d2 of course not allowing the capture the bishop pair is very important here if you don't have to give it up you shouldn't uh, knight to c6 and now rook back to a1 the rook on a7 is attacked so it uh, uh, kind of overstayed its welcome uh knight to d back to b4 and now bishop back to e3 defending the pawn here and preparing rook to d1 so knight back to d5 attacking the bishop and now bishop to c1 obviously if a bishop to d2 maybe uh, Juwen repeats knight to b4 maybe we would see a threefold repetition uh and of course you do not want to squander the white pieces uh, just like that so that's why of course bishop to c1 rook to a8 and now rook to d1 the rook will be much more useful here defending d four and also it's very nicely positioned uh rook captures on a1 queen captures and now knight c to b4 we have knight to c5 now putting pressure on the bishop here and just bishop to c6 so also uh, uh keeping the bishop pair we have bishop to d2 and now queen to b8 trying to introduce the queen into the game somehow uh we have queen to a5 now uh putting a uh, pressure on that queen side and also the rook really uh, no longer needs to stay on d1 rook to c1 is coming and there will be a lot of work uh, for this rook on the c file we have rook to d8 and now rook to c1 now if the knight moves uh, you, you you have to be careful not to lose that bishop we have queen to b6 offering a queen trade 
and um, uh, uh, things really uh, oblige us. Uh, we have captures, captures, and uh, now knight to a6, offering a trade of knights, but just bishop to b7. Uh, also, you have to be careful if knight captures knight, then also rook captures bishop uh, could be possible. So, uh, both of them just keeping their bishop pairs intact. We have knight to c7 now, uh, and pawn to g5, grabbing more space on the king side, also preparing g4, which might weaken the d4 pawn, could be important later on. Uh, so, uh, later just stops it we have h3 and now knight to f4 and here uh the bishop pair uh it's a very hard it's not easy to keep the bishop pair here you really want to play knight to f1 to control the knight but then uh bishop captures knight is definitely coming and this is really gonna uh, weaken white's king side messing up the pawn structure and everything so instead knight to f4 we have bishop captures on f4 g captures on f4 now uh ju and jun uh willingly doubles her uh, f pawn and uh, introduces some imbalance in the in the position uh well this is definitely a way to play for for more than a draw uh, we have knight to b5 uh, now preparing rook to c7 this would be excellent you know that once the rook reaches the seventh rank it becomes a pig and then it just gobbles everything up so of course that needs to be prevented we have bishop to c6 the bishop is safe here as it's very hard to disrupt the knight on b4 that's defending the bishop so king to f1 uh Lighting J just uh, starts bringing the king into the game, and Ju Wenjun does the same. King to f8, rook to d1, and now rook to a8. Trying to get the rook uh, also on a2. Also, the rook on a2 is basically the seventh rank from Black's perspective. So, also uh, wants to promote her rook to a pig. We have knight to c3, of course, stopping that, and now knight to a2, removing the stopper. Uh, so, knight captures on a2, rook captures on a2, and now knight to e1. Okay, you can attack the b pawn, but then the knight is coming uh, for the f uh, uh, for the f pawn so rook to b2 we have knight to d3 and now rook captures on b3 knight captures on f4 so it's a bit easier giving up the f4 pawn as it's a doubled pawn and now you also have the pass b pawn so uh, it's a bit of a trade-off as you can see uh lei is uh, up, up a pawn but uh, ju and jun uh, is uh, uh well not up anything but she does have the bishop pair so you have the bishop pair uh the rook and the past b pawn now i don't know uh what you guys would choose the extra pawn or the bishop pair in the past b pawn uh, but i have a pretty good idea what you would choose so here we have bishop uh, to a3 now trying to position the bishops perfectly to advance that pawn and now pawn to d5 you can't really wait and do nothing uh, if you give uh, black a few moves then she will just uh, uh, you know position her pieces properly and start advancing that pawn so here you have to react to the pawn thrust of course e captures on d5 knight captures on d5 and now bishop to c now the bishop pair is fully operational and it's not going to be easy to get that white king into the game knight to f6 and now we have rook to b2 uh now you again you have to be very careful the idea could be bishop captures and g2 check then the king captures and then you pick up the bishop here you win another pawn you mess up white's pawn structure uh you would not be not be very happy here so how can you stop this well there are a couple of moves you could play you could play knight to d7 check which is interesting of course uh uh, it seems that either you uh, give up this bishop or white will capture this bishop at will but let's say king to e7 now knight captures on c5 b captures on c5 this is now a past c pawn and let's say bishop to c4 now with some ideas of maybe even going after the uh, maybe even going after the f7 pawn uh, rook to c2 attacks the bishop tries to get his uh, her past c pawn uh, uh, down the board bishop to d3 rook to b2 and now bishop to c4 we have rook to b4 bishop to d5 let's say offering a trade of bishops and now if you really want to keep the bishops bishop to b5 with check king to g1 and now pawn to c4 the pawn would start uh, marching down the board but you can also play rook to c1 and it will be very very hard to actually push that pawn down the board and let's say f6 f4 and even if you trade here all of these squares are now uh, covered by the bishop and by the pawn so yes uh it's not it's definitely not much you're down a pawn and uh okay it's already a pass pawn and c4 but you are down a pawn and you don't really have all that uh, uh many ideas on how to continue this so it's not the best uh so instead of that uh, after this um uh, rook to b2 move we don't have knight to d7 right away we first have pawn to f4 now what's the idea behind pawn to f4 is now is after pawn to f4 bishop captures on g2 even an idea let's say you play bishop captures on g2 
king captures and rook captures. Yes, you won a pawn, but now king to f3, and if rook to e3, check king to g4. And now if you evaluate this position, once the king comes to f5, it's a light square, or the king can even go after the uh, the h pawn to win another one if this rook stops, for example, attacking the h3 pawn. Uh, it just seems like you've given uh, white too much activity for, for, for grabbing that one pawn. So instead, after pawn to f4, we don't have bishop captures on g2. Rook to b4 is played, going after the f4 pawn, and now lay just goes for g3, defends the, the f4 pawn. We have rook to b3 now, attacking the b3 pawn, and you can see how it's very hard for the king to help out with uh, any of this, as the bishop pair is doing such marvel work. Uh, now we have knight to d7 with check. Uh, now again, if you wanted to maybe try something like rook to d3 because you really don't want to trade, you really want to keep the tension here, uh, black can always just repeat rook to b1 with check and you have to move back. So it's not really an option. So instead after rook to b3, we have knight to d7 with check and now you can have two options and none of them are what you want to play. Uh, because if you play king to e7, then knight captures on c5 and after b captures, let's say king to f2, you defend your pawn, uh, okay, you're just down a pawn, and we have bishops of the same color, so if anyone is better here, it's definitely white, it doesn't really matter that you have a, a passed c pawn, so of course, it's better to trade differently, in the game, bishop captures and d7 was played, rook captures, and now also rook captures and g3, so now it's equal material, and the bishops are of opposite color, so unless you really mess something up here, it will be a draw, so bishop to g4, we have rook to e3, and now king to g2, we have bishop to e7 uh, and rook to b7. So uh, very nicely done, placing the rook behind the passed pawn. Now comes pawn to f6. We have pawn to e6, creating a passed pawn here, and now pawn to h5, trying to trade this pawn for this pawn, but of course you're not going to do that. Bishop to f5, we have pawn to h4, not allowing the king to go any further, uh, and now bishop to g4. We have rook to g3 with check, king to f2, and bishop to c5 with check. We have king to f1, and now bishop back to e7. Of course, you, you cannot allow rook to f7 check, you have to move the bishop back, bishop to e7 was played, king to e2, and now rook to b3. We have pawn to f5, and now pawn to b5. We have king to d2, and now pawn to b4. So the pawn is now nicely defended, if you can somehow get uh, the, the, the rook down the board, maybe continue pushing the pawn, uh, good things might happen, but the white rook is already behind the pass pawn, and that's never uh, never good for you. Rook to b8 check, we have king to g7, and now rook to e8 going after the bishop, but now just bishop to d6. We have rook to d8 attacking the bishop, bishop e7, rook to e8, bishop to d6, rook to d8, bishop to e7, rook to e8, and he was in this position, unmoved 63, that uh, Ting Jele and uh, Ju Wenjun uh, agreed to a draw, or rather it's a draw by threefold repetition. So it was a, was an interesting game. Um, uh, White was, uh, well, she was up a pawn, but uh, Ju Wenjun had the bishop pair and the pass B pawn, so it, it, like I said, it's a trade-off. At some point, um, uh, Lei Tingjie had to give back the pawn, and you had this, uh, well, very, very equal endgame with bishops of opposite color. So that's game four of the FIDE Women's World Chess Championship. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, like I said, I will I will uh, be, be covering uh, all, all of them until the end of the uh, end of the tournament, so we'll see uh, what happens in the other uh, uh, in the other games and uh, like I said in, in the beginning uh, I was uh, thinking because it's uh, a shorter time format than we've had in the Nepo Ding World Chess Championship match I thought the games will be uh, a lot more active but for some reason they aren't and probably probably and this is only uh, my opinion I, I haven't really read that anywhere uh, it's probably due to the time control being um, uh, well 30 uh, 30 seconds increment being given already on move one so that uh, you you know you're never in trouble. You know that whatever happens, if you are you know swimming uh, safely in the protected waters of theory, nothing bad will happen to you. And that 30 seconds increment starting from move one will always. Uh well, keep the positions timid. So I think that uh, even though uh, Nepo and Ding had uh, more time in the actual classical games for the first 40 moves and then for the next 20, I think that uh, uh, giving time control starting only after move 60 
is the way to go, but I don't know. I, I could be wrong on this. Maybe you guys have a different take on this. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's the game. I uh, hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. We'll see what happens in game five and the rest of the uh, rest of the event. Uh, I would like to thank James Eugene Cashman, Paul Miller, Brad Roth, uh, Michael Marshall, and BulletChestThriller.com for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. As usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Continuing to check up uh, on your wonderful suggestions and everything else that's happening in the chess world also while covering the FIDE Women's World Chess Championship match. Uh, thank you all. I will see you soon and have an excellent rest of your day.